the small schools instrument at least, the teacher does one teacher, in each teacher does one teacher instructional profile. And then they don't ask as, answer as many questions in each subject area. Is that true, Larry? That's why we put the teacher instructional profile in, was primarily for the elementary teachers that teach every subject. We don't want them to have to answer the same questions for English and reading and all that. We want them to share with us how they teach across the curriculum. But we do feel it's important that, that they at least think about the curriculum guides and that they at least think about the, having goals. And so what about spirituality? Why else would we have a school if it's not spiritual? So we want to hear from the teacher how they infuse spirituality, how they meet the various learning needs of the students, and, um, and what community resources. So we want to think about these things. There are six through 10 on the next page, uh, questions that we felt were really important for every teacher to think about and respond to. Then we, can, we come to the subject areas. And you'll notice that there's a, there's a recurring format in the subject area pages. There's an instructional assessment section. We ask three questions in art about the planning process, specific plans uh, for students' transition from elementary to secondary, and what plans or procedures are in place for your school to encourage interaction. <coughs> All right. Then there's instructional assessments. We ask for some instructional assessments in, in each of the subject areas. Uh, sometimes there's a, a materials and equipment list that we ask you to uh, fill out. Then some evaluation questions. List the improvements in this area over the last three years. Identify strengths, and then describe improvements and strengths. Now, I'll, guarantee, I'll tell you that recommendations and commendations come out of this section where you list your strengths and areas that need to be improved. That's the grist for uh, recommendations and commendations. And then uh, F is recommendations for improvement. If you review all those sections, what areas would you like to improve? And again, that's uh, where we look for recommendations to come from those. Again, this is where your coordinating committee will want to work with the study committees from these subject areas to make sure that there's not an ax being grinded in one area or ground in one place and not in others. All right, and these, uh, you, this is the most comprehensive one because as you leaf back through these pages, you'll see that there are sections for elementary, second, sections for secondary, and sections for K-12. And so this is the most comprehensive of the documents that we prepared was for a K-12 school that is seeking K-12 accreditation. There are fewer sections and questions in the 912 and in the 1 through 8 and 1 through 10 uh, drafts. I'm to page 161. School-wide improvement action plans, SIAPs. I told you we'd get there. Um, there's a sample sheet there of what one might look like, um, some instructions on how to put them together. And this is an area that uh, schools, as I mentioned, have struggled with. What the hope of the committee was, was that after you complete the entire self-study, it's all fresh in your mind, that the whole group take a couple steps backwards and say, what are the two or three really important initiatives that we want to tackle that are comprehensive school-wide improvement action plans? And we're suggesting that more than three, maybe four, would be too many. We want you to get those three or four things that you think would improve the whole school and we would encourage that it be a multifaceted, <coughs> multi-step, multi-resource kind of a thing. Some, some action plans have said we want to buy new computers for the computer lab. Well, that's going to take a board decision and a purchase and an installation. I would not say that's a school-wide improvement action plan. Now, if you said we're going to provide computers in every classroom, and we're going to update the software every year, and we're going to update the computers every two years, that might be a school-wide improvement action plan. It's going to be multi-step, it's going to be multi-faceted, it's something that will carry over the full six years of the term. That might be a school-wide improvement action plan. Uh, so try and, and 
focus, step back from your study and say, what are the two or three areas uh, that really will impact our school, school-wide? And those become your school-wide improvement action plans. Any questions on that? It's an area where a lot of questions have come up because people write ones that are just, it'll take six months to get done, or two months, or one decision and one faculty member. That's not what we're looking for. That would be something that would be found in a subject area or a standard section for an area that you'd like to improve. Question. Yes. How broad can those be? Because I've gone through this twice and sometimes they get too specific. And how broad okay. can you take? Like one of our first ones was improve academics. And then they listed 10 specifics. Is okay. there a the question is how broad would that be? And again, improving academics is very broad. I mean, that's a general statement. But if in your action plan you have action steps that would define that, I think that would be an appropriate action plan. So that's what they did, and they have 10 specific. Yeah. Again, I just wondered if there's anything too broad. No, I think, I think we're looking for that specificity within the action plan. If you just said improve academics and we're going to talk about it three times a year, that's, that's not, we're going to ask you to revise that action plan. <coughs> And here's what the visiting committee can do with your action plans. They can accept them as written. They can ask you to revise them. They can reject it. Or they can ask you to write another one. And sometimes a visiting committee will come and with a fresh look at the campus, they'll discover a theme that's running through the campus that maybe you missed. And in that case, they'll ask you to write a school-wide action, improvement action plan and to be implemented over the period of the term. So those are the options that a visiting committee has as they review your school-wide improvement action plans. Any other questions on that? Again, I can't stress enough, and Larry's going to come and help me. Make it a school-wide issue uh, that has action steps that can be identified. We've seen schools that have written 35 yeah. action plans. <laughs> Don't write 35 action plans. But they're one step, one faceted. Yeah, and, and they're paint, you know, paint the outside of the school. Well, if it can be done in a, in a week, if it can be done by three people, if it can be done with, you know, one decision of course, <laughs> then it's not an action plan. Number two, we have the broad ones that says fix the curriculum or um, better in service. For faculty. You know, they're too broad. The good ones say um, develop a strategy for uh, writing across the curriculum or reading, you know, reading at the, at the content level or something that affects all the teachers, all the students on a global basis and it's going to be a long-term project. Now the whole, the whole theory behind this is we used to come in as a visiting committee and the experts, we would come in from the outside and tell you what's wrong with you. Some of you, that's pretty easy. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I was talking to David. <laughs> um, we would come in and say, here's, here's what we think is wrong with you. Yeah. And here's how we think you ought to fix it. We're not going to do that anymore. We're not doing that anymore. We're saying the most important thing that you're going to do as a school is the self-study. That's the heart and the meat of the evaluation process, is the self-study. And the core of the self-study is we've now looked at each other, we've now looked at your program, and we've said, you've looked at your program and you've said, here are the things that, that we see are problems on our campus. And from the inside, we see that this is the way to best fix the problems that we see. Not an outside group coming in and saying, here's how you fix your problems, but you knowing the whole global picture, here's the best way for us to solve the major problems that we have on this campus. And then you write those action plans and then what our job is, is to say, is to validate those action plans and say, yes, you hit the nail on the head, or turn your ship, you know, 10 degrees to the left and you'll have it, that's where we, where we see your issue is. Um, or the, the forest is so thick that you didn't see 
you know, the 800-pound um, gorilla in the back of the room. And then for you to sit down and actually go through this, and we will hold you accountable for, for the next six years to work through those action plans in your progress report. So your action plans, that, and stay close, Larry, I think there's some people with questions, but your action plans will guide you through the next, the next a term of accreditation. And so make them things that, that will guide you through. Yes, you go back and review the major recommendations and, and that were left by the visiting committee, but the primary thing that will guide your school through the next term of accreditation is, are your action plans. Dennis. Emphasizing action plans, what impact do action plans have on the overall evaluation process? For example, if your action plans are badly written or badly articulated, does that affect your accreditation? Um, the question is, what happens if you have badly, poorly written action plans, um, and the team comes on campus and your all your action plans are poorly written? And what effect does that have on your term? That's right. Well. Um, that's, a, that's a little tough, little ambiguous to answer. If, and we understand, let me say up front, we understand that this is a learning process and that we do not expect schools to have perfectly written action plans. I think if Kelly and I were to go into a school and, and try to write action plans, we would have some that if we looked at them five years later that we would say we would have wished we would have tweaked them a little differently when we wrote them now. We understand that this is a learning process. If your school is in serious, it has some real serious issues, and you did not address any of them in the action plans, and you only dealt with squeaky doors and holes in the screens, and you did not address the real issues on your campus, that is going to affect your, your term, because you, you're not seeing, as a school, what your issues are. And so the team's going to say, you need to actually deal with the real issues on your campus, not the peripheral issues. One of the, uh, one, the issue we're really dealing with when, when we come to, uh, to the term is capacity. The question we ask ourselves as a visiting committee is, does this school have the capacity to make it for six more years without somebody coming back and helping them. And so that's the real issue we're looking at when we're, when we're discussing a term. Do we need to come back quicker than six years? And so the, the school-wide improvement action plans by themselves, if the school is running a strong program and the students are learning well and, and you've <coughs> documented that, that by itself probably would have a minimal effect on a, on a term recommendation. <coughs> But so it's, it's primarily we're looking at what's happening to students and is, is that effective? And does the school have the capacity to continue without extra oversight over the period of the term? Um, a question here. I just, the first time we did it 20 years ago, the people were, including myself, were afraid of failure. Uh -huh. Like failure moved over the process. But in doing it twice, you see that <coughs> failure is not an option really unless you're just totally messed up. So if people can be <coughs> that we're not going to fail in this, we may get a shorter term or whatever, but you take that fear of failure off the table, people are like relaxed. They, but they, the first time we looked at it, like, man, if we fail, we're going to lose our retirement, our jobs, and our kids are going to be on the street. And, you know, uh, it, Is there a way to reassure the staff yeah. and the people that this I've is I've been at this uh, 30 plus years now, and in my whole career, I think I remember one, maybe two schools whose accreditation was denied in, in 30s. Maybe there's more, but not, not very many more. But even at that point, they just- but I mean, that's somebody, that's somebody that, you know, they weren't following the curriculum. They, you know, they didn't have in, uh, teachers who had credentials or endorsements. Uh, you know, they just basically weren't an admin school. From my, my perspective, the easiest way to fail the evaluation is to blow up the, the uh, self-study. If, if we come in as a team and we see, and this has happened to all of us, one guy sat down and wrote it in a week and sent it in. Yeah, and, and it's obvious that you, you talk to the board and they say, what? 
and, and you look at the action plans and you look at that and they say, who in the <coughs> world wrote that? Because we